So let's chat a little bit about uh, the Me Too movement mm -hmm. that has come out. When you first started seeing this on the news, what were your thoughts? It's about time. Um, and I also was filled with an incredible pride and excitement about how powerful the voices of women across this country have become and how unified they've become. You know, it sort of started with Harvey Weinstein and then we started hearing about more actors and people in Hollywood and then it turned political. Yeah, as things always do. And of course, in every area of our lives, whether we're talking about the media world or the world of film or the world of politics or the world of working as a server in a restaurant, there isn't a single person in this country, a single woman and many men who haven't been touched in some way, shape or form by what it feels like to have someone in a position of power over you use that power in a way that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that kind of blew the head off for Texas is when we learned about this burn book. Yes. This list at the Capitol. Were you at all surprised or was it for, for someone now removed from the Capitol? Was it known? I wouldn't say I was surprised. I didn't know about it, but it comes as no surprise to me, particularly when you think about the young women that started this book, they were Democratic staffers, women in the progressive movement who have really been at the forefront of saying it's not acceptable. And I love that what they did was share with each other uh, some education and information about what to be aware of when it comes to working in that capital. What it also says, though, is that they had to create their own system for communicating this because there really wasn't a larger, more formal structure for doing so. And I think the fact that the burn book existed at all really speaks to the fact that we've got a real problem going on in the Texas Capitol where we don't have a safe place that women, whether they're staffers, lobbyists, uh, or others who are coming before the legislature feel that they can go to voice these concerns and complaints. And when we think about what it started as, it's no longer just among that, that group of women, right? That's it's now right. spread across for women at the Capitol. Yes, it's true. I think that's the power of sharing our stories. And that's really what that burn book was doing. That's what the Me Too movement was about. When we give voice to our own personal experiences, we empower other people to feel safe that they can come forward and do the very same thing. And that's why I'm so encouraged about where we are right now. There are women all over this country that are coming forward, speaking their personal truth and empowering other women to do it. And it's creating a cascade of unification of women and men who support women who are coming forward and saying, this is not acceptable, we're going to bring it out of the shadows and we're going to make sure that we shame and appropriately blame and hold responsible those who are acting inappropriately. You know, we talk about personal experience and you have been one of the women who is brave enough to talk about what even happened with you, um, both at the Capitol and working as a waitress even before you know, you got into that position. Mm -hmm. it, let's talk a little bit about some of that, if that's okay. Talk to us sure. about, there's a story you shared about when you were a waitress. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. I think this happens to people in the domestic and service industry in far greater numbers than we realize is the case. And it's because those of us who work in those positions typically depend on that job literally for our very livelihoods. And we don't have the luxury of complaining when we feel like we're being mistreated. When I was a young single mom and I was waiting tables as a second job in addition to my full-time job to try to make ends meet, I had an experience one evening when a gentleman that I was waiting on put his hand up the back of my skirt and ran it up the back of my leg while his wife was literally sitting across the table from him. And I didn't feel like I could do anything about it because I knew that I was depending on the tip I was going to earn from that person to pay my babysitter that night. 
There are women all over America that are in that position. And that's why I think it's so important that when we do have the power to come forward and we have the power to represent how inappropriate that is, that we do so not only for ourselves, but understanding that sometimes we're speaking for people who don't feel like they have the power to speak for themselves. Right. When we fast forward, you know, 20 something years later, mm -hmm. you had another experience as a senator. As a senator, and but this time a very different one because I had the power to do something about it. And I did it in my own quiet way, but in an effective way. In this particular instance, as a senator um, at a social function with other legislators, a newly sworn in House member touched me in an incredibly inappropriate way. I don't believe he knew I was a senator at the time. And because I was a senator though, I had the power to make sure that in alignment with other House members and state senators, we could keep this individual from passing legislation unless and until he came and apologized to me. It took him three sessions before he finally did that. And in those first two sessions, he wasn't able to get a single bill passed. So I had power to hold him accountable and responsible for what he did. What I recognize though in that Capitol, whether you're a reporter or a lobbyist or someone who is interning or staffing there, there really is no system to hold people accountable for what can be some pretty inappropriate behavior. What do you feel, uh, when we say, and just so we're, we're clear, when, the, when he touched you, it was clearly inappropriate. No one could have said this is not appropriate. 100%. Yeah. And so what do you feel empowered or emboldened him to do such a thing? I think sometimes, particularly um, people who are in elected positions, maybe people who have powerful positions in production or in um, an industry that is predominantly male, there develops over time this sense of entitlement and empowerment and privilege uh, to do with other people as you choose. And I think this person just fit that mold that he'd been elected, that somehow that put him in a position of entitlement and that I, as someone who was younger than him, and I assume he believed maybe I was a staffer or a lobbyist, that he was entitled to behave with me as he did. How long did it take him? Obviously it took three sessions for him to apologize. But how long did it take for him to kind of realize, oh, this is why I can't get anything passed? It took quite a while. It took quite a while. And do you think that's because he didn't really think what he did was wrong? I think it took him a while to connect the dots that his behavior had created the impasse that he was meeting on the legislative side. And when he apologized, what, what, are, what does that apology sound like? <laughs> it, was, it was fairly lukewarm. Um, it was the classic, I don't really remember what I did. Um, but if I acted in a way that was inappropriate, I'm sorry. Was that enough for you? It was something. It was at least an understanding that there was going to be some accountability for behavior that's not appropriate. I do think too often, though, uh, perpetrators get away with the I don't recall what I did excuse. Um, and I think there's greater and greater heat, appropriately so that women and men are bringing to the table that says we're not going to accept that as an excuse for your behavior. Mm -hmm. Are you able to tell, or are you open to tell, is this person still serving? I'm just not going to go there. Okay. You know, when you now see what's happening and you have, you know, Representative Howard and Representative Israel and, and these other members of the House and Senate really saying, okay, whoa, enough is enough. We've got to make some changes here. Uh, are you encouraged at all by that or because it's moving slowly, <laughs> you know, what are your thoughts? I do think these are really complex issues and where you don't have any structure in place whatsoever to respond to them. It's going to be a fairly complex process to make sure you build the sort of response that is appropriate and needed. 
I think what they're doing on the House side is really working toward that. And of course, Representative Howard has been an incredible leader in making sure that that happens and making sure that we're looking at best practices around the country, that we're hearing from victims, survivors, that we're hearing from groups that help represent women in the sexual assault and men in the sexual assault world, and that we're hearing from experts in terms of what appropriate responses look like. That's not happening, unfortunately, on the Senate side. And I have great concern that there's a, a public-facing effort to make it appear as though something is being done. However, at this point, there's been one hearing, um, hearing from only invited witnesses, and only two people were invited to be witnesses, and they actually work in the Capitol in an administrative capacity, the Secretary of the Senate and someone who works for her. No one who has experienced sexual assault was asked to talk about that. No victims' rights organizations were asked. No experts in the field of how we best create systems of accountability and response were asked to be there. And so I do wonder with great concern uh, whether this is just kind of lipstick on a pig or whether it's a real effort to actually make sure that we change things there. You know, one of the things that I, and I, I jumped ahead and I, what I meant to ask you too is, what I think is interesting is sometimes people don't realize that they're putting women in these positions with the things that they say. And one of the things yeah. that pops into my head is I think about how you were often referred to, and I'm sure you know, as like the Barbie doll like mm -hmm. of the Senate and how what someone may see as a compliment is demeaning to yes. your work and your effort and what you bring to the table. Yes. Even something that small, right? No question about it. I, I think there are sometimes um, subconscious ways that we communicate about women that demean them nonetheless. And it's up to us to start talking about that and bringing it forward to people's consciousness so they do understand that while you may think that you're levying a compliment, you're actually, by labeling someone in that way, diminishing who they are as leaders, as people who have incredibly strong work ethics, incredibly strong um, records of having fought for their constituents successfully on many different fronts. It is a single way of classifying a woman so that her value is only about what she looks like and not all of the things that she's achieved. I try to be really thoughtful in the way that I talk to my granddaughter who's only a year and a half old in terms of the positive things I say about her. I want her to know that she's valued for how clever she is, how smart she is, how brave she is, and not just how, and of course she is, beautiful um, she is. But I do think we need to be more conscious about that in the workplace as well. When we look for solutions at the Capitol to hold these lawmakers accountable, um, even when we look at what happened with you, you were able to hold this person accountable, mm -hmm. but because voters were unaware, they continued to elect this person. Right. <clears throat> so how do we build up that aspect of it, even in your own, even in your own yeah. story? It's such a good question, and one of the ideas that I've floated, I don't know if it's the appropriate mechanism, but I think some third-party review is really important. In the state of Texas right now, we have an ethics commission. If a lawmaker is taking money from an organization and then voting favorably for them in a way that it's an inappropriate connection, for example, those kinds of allegations can go through an ethics commission. Perhaps you didn't appropriately report gifts from someone who has come to you and asked for your help on, on lawmaking. That can go through the ethics commission. And ultimately, that third party investigatory body issues a decision. And that decision is now a, an objective third party piece of information that can be presented to voters in the context of a campaign. 
We don't have anything like that. No similar process like that for inappropriate sexual behavior in the Texas Capitol. And it seems to me that if we could set up some kind of arbiter of the truth that provides an opportunity not only for the person who is alleging inappropriate behavior, but also the person about whom that's being alleged to levy a complaint, to respond to a complaint, and to have this third party review take place. So that if a finding is made that someone has inappropriately acted in the Texas Capitol workplace, they can be held responsible by voters because they'll have information available to them that's a lot more powerful than a he said, she said situation. But it's even hard to get women in the Capitol to report. Um, you you know, won't report if you don't feel like it's going to go anywhere because you're too fearful that you're going to suffer some consequence from that. So many of these young women who are working in the Capitol are there because they have dreams and ambitions for themselves in the political world in some way, shape or form, whether they want to be standing on the floor with a microphone in their hand or they want to be working on the staff side and you know climbing up that ladder, whatever that future looks like for them, they understand that they're working with a lot of really powerful people there and they don't want to be the person who comes forward and complains and to feel all of the negative consequences of that and no positive affirming um, decision making that helps to make sure that it was worthwhile to go through all of that. Yeah, I think one of the comments that was made to me in, in my effort in trying to get someone to speak about this story was someone said, well, I mean, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't mm -hmm. enough to where I should say something. What would you want to say to those women working under the dome? I think we have to redefine in a way that's very self-respecting what we believe is acceptable and not acceptable. And that's what I think the power behind the Me Too movement brings that we haven't seen before. We've always had a process where a lawsuit could be filed. In some workplaces, we have a process where there is a human resource officer that we can go and report to. But none of those have made women feel like something's actually going to be done. The bar is so high, the standard is quite high to meet, for example, in a lawsuit. However, where women are now coming forward and simply sharing the unacceptable things that have happened to them, it's helping raise our own consciousness about what we've experienced and what we've kind of brushed aside and what we've said for so long. Well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> You got to go along and get along to be able to succeed. You got to be quiet, put your head down, ignore it. What we're learning from each other are the things that we ought not to say are okay anymore. And I think we're going to be changing even what we say to ourselves about what's bad, what's not so bad. Um, and, and I think it's going to continue to grow and continue to be very positive in terms of the way we expect that we ought to be treated. Would Wendy today tell young waitress Wendy to speak up? No, and, and I, I'll tell you why. And this is back to my earlier point where when we have the opportunity to speak on behalf of women who are in such vulnerable positions they can't speak up, we need to make sure that we take the responsibility to do that. What I don't want to do is express some judgment on a person who is in a vulnerable workplace, in a vulnerable uh, position in terms of how precarious their financial lives are and the risk they might take at coming forward. I don't want to ever come across as looking as though I'm judging a young person or not so young person who's experiencing that and who's not reporting it. I get it. I know why people don't report when they're in such vulnerable spaces. That's why it's up to us in the policymaking world and otherwise to begin to create 
such a system of intolerance for that kind of behavior that ultimately we do create a safe space for people who are in those vulnerable workplaces and we give them the room to feel like they can speak up. Right now, I just don't feel like we've done that yet. Do you, do you have hope that we're gonna get there? I do. I have a great deal of hope. I'm so optimistic after what I've seen women achieving in this last year, whether we're talking about the Me Too movement, whether we're talking about the extraordinary percentage of women who are now running for office all over this country, whether we're talking about how high the percentage of women voters is becoming in some of these pivotal election contests that we've been seeing across the country, or whether we're talking about the extraordinarily high level of women who are showing up at the town halls and making the phone calls to their Congress people and their state elected and city elected office holders, more women than men and more women than ever before are stepping forward and leading the outcry about what it is we expect, what it is we should rightly demand from people who are elected to serve us. And behind all of that, I feel not only an incredible momentum, but also I look forward to where that's going to lead us because I think it's taking us in a really positive direction. You have a quote over here sitting on your desk. Um, um, you can see it, right? Yes. <laughs> I want you to read the quote and tell me the feeling as to why you put that on your desk. So the quote is from Bella Abzug, who of course was a, a very well-known feminist back in her day. You're not going to have a society that understands its humanity if you don't have more women in government. And I truly believe that, that more women elected to office and increasing that percent right now at the congressional level, it's only about 20% women at state office levels. It's usually around 24, 25%. That's the number we're at here in the state of Texas, for example. Of course, we can expect that if we don't have more women there, women who bring a broad host of experiences with us and who bring a special and unique and important perspective to lawmaking, unless and until our voices are at those tables, I think we're gonna to continue to see a, a failure, really, to create the kind of world that recognizes the respect for women and the equity with which women ought to be treated at every level of government, society, and workplaces across this country, it's not gonna happen until we have more women there. Right. And it's nothing against men. Not at all. We just need to be a little more <laughs> fair and equitable, right? That's right. I mean, we can work very hard to think about what it's like to walk in each other's shoes. And there are some great men out there who are feminists and who are fighting for all the right things. But unless we're there to talk about what the experiences are, the shoes in which we walk, if we're not in those conversations and fighting the battles that only our life experiences can inform, then of course we can expect that we're not gonna advance in the way that we want to advance. And that is true across the board, whether we're talking about making sure that we have more people of color who are there representing their walked and lived experiences, more people in the LGBTQ community who are there representing their lived and walked experiences. We won't ever fully represent all of us until all of us are there to be represented in the conversations. Anything else you would like to add? Any questions? No, no? That's good. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you.